Hey guys, today we're doing a review, but not of a printer, of a 3D scanner. So this is Creality's new budget 3D scanner called the CR Scan Ferret Pro. Uh, it sports some pretty impressive specs at an absurdly low price point. I've spent a couple weeks with this now in order to do this review, and oh do I have some things to say about this. Creality is a leading global consumer level 3D printing brand that focuses on 3D printer research and production. They develop FDM printers and resin printers. They're surprisingly inexpensive, but given their price, they tend to exceed expectations. And you could argue that Creality was a catalyst for some of the modern 3D printing boom in the last few years by making this technology so much more accessible to a much wider base. If you're interested in buying the scanner, you can get it on discount until the end of the year for about $380, I believe. It also has a non-pro version, uh, which is around $320. So at about $400 for the scanner, and all the peripherals and everything that go with it. It's by far the most affordable scanner you can get and not just by a little bit. Like the next best scanner costs at least twice as much, like around $700. And that's even cheap for an industry that a couple years ago, it we're talking thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars for access to this technology, which is why it was a industrial technology before now. But just like with 3D printers, Creality's trying their hand, bringing this technology to a market that really didn't exist before. Now, a couple disclosures. First of all, I'm not getting paid for this review. I got paid by them sending me a free scanner and I get to keep it, but I'm under no obligation to say anything nice about it or the company. I'm here to give you my honest review about a technology I've never really played with before. And that's actually my second disclaimer. I've never used a 3D scanner before, so I won't be able to tell you how this compares to other scanners. This review is gonna be from the perspective of someone new to 3D scanning. And if you've seen some of my other videos, you'd know that my focus is generally engineering. But my main angle was dimensional accuracy and for engineering applications. I really wanted to see how well I could scan an object and that the model would actually come out dimensionally accurate with the correct sizes uh, and without body distortions. And so along the way, primarily while I was waiting for this thing to get delivered, I designed and printed this two axis turntable. So it'll actually take apart and spin it on the turntable itself, which is a normal fixture for 3D scanning, but also I can fix a camera to this and it uses a motor, which I can use to move this thing up and down to get different viewpoints. This will allow it to get the top. And if I have something that could elevate it, it could also get the bottom. So I will go over how well that thing worked on this, uh, with this scanner as well. Over the past couple of weeks, I've attempted to scan a whole lot of different things with this. Uh, my initial impressions are that it does some things extraordinarily well, like really exceeded my expectations. And then most things it actually fails miserably. Uh, and I'll go into what those things are, but my overall assessment is that this is a fantastic device uh, that probably requires some experience to use uh, and can do some really cool things, but it's not for everyone and it's certainly not for every application. So this is the CR Scan Ferret Pro. There's also the non-pro version, just the Ferret. Uh, they're pretty much identical except for this box right here, which is the wireless bridge. For about $100 extra, which allows you to connect wirelessly to your phone or computer so you don't have to have a big long USB cable, which could constrain your motion while you're trying to do, you know, your 360 degree scanning of your object. Besides that, the Ferret and the Ferret Pro are pretty much identical. They support the same feature list, which is anti-shake tracking. It's also supposedly better at scanning black and metallic objects. Traditionally, a lot of scanners, even expensive ones, have trouble with black and metallic objects, and you would be recommended to spray those or cover them with some kind of like white matte powder or paint uh, to help with the scanning process. It can also scan outdoors and in bright sunlight. And one of the things that I found the most interesting was 24-bit color scan. So not only will it scan the geometry of the object, it will superimpose all the color that it got through the main camera on that object, which is actually very impressive. Uh, sometimes it actually makes the models look better than they actually are, but it's still a really neat feature. And then the last feature is the high quality and fast scanning with dedicated ASIC processing chip. When you start a scan, you can actually pick whether you want high quality or fast. And the ASIC processing chip, I assume, is a dedicated chip which does some of the processing on the device, uh, which makes it especially suitable for using, say, with a, with a phone, which may not have a computing power to handle the, the high amounts of information that this is picking up at 30 frames per second. So my initial impression of the packaging is actually really positive. It comes with this nice tightly organized case with places for everything and this little pocket in the top with a zipper for holding cables. There's actually quite a few cables, which is kind of confusing at first, but it came with some diagrams about the different configurations and there's a cable for each of those. So you can hook the camera directly up to the uh, wireless bridge, which can then hook up into the battery pack here, which, which is in the tripod, which will power both of them. Uh, you could also plug the camera directly into a phone or directly into a computer via USB cable. And if you're using the phone, you can also charge both your phone and the device from the battery tripod, which is a pretty cool feature. The quickest way to get started with this device is to forget the wireless bridge and just simply plug the camera directly into your phone or your computer. 
you can, on a phone, you can download the app from whatever store is appropriate. Uh, or if you're on a computer, go to the Creality website and download what's called the Creality Scan software. Uh, it should detect automatically that the device is connected via USB. So the app that you install on Android or iOS uh, has built-in support for using the wireless bridge. Though at the time I made this video, there was no support for it in the PC or OS X version of the Creality Scan software. However, support did provide me a, like an advanced beta version that did have support for it, and that's what I used for the majority of this video. They claim it's gonna be merged into the main software by the end of the year, so by the time you're watching this, it'll most likely be fully supported. It was worth mentioning though, because I was using the beta version of the Creality Scan software for most of this review. So some of the problems you'll see later, not related to the wireless bridge, I suspect were actually related to the fact that I was using the beta software. When you plug this in and you see the green or blue light on it, that means that it's broadcasting its own Wi-Fi network. So on your phone or your computer, you will connect to that Wi-Fi network, uh, which means actually disconnecting from the regular internet. And once you have done that and you start the Creality Scan software, it will detect that and it will be connected to this device. Once the Wi-Fi bridge was active and I was scanning, it was a totally flawless experience. I did more than an hour worth of scanning while using the wireless bridge and it never flaked on me once. So let's take a look at some of my success stories with this. I'm gonna show off what this thing is capable of and then I'll go over the things it didn't do so well so you can get an idea of what you should not buy this device for. One thing I was looking forward to doing uh, when I got this scanner was to learn some more organic modeling with programs like Mesh Mixer for sculpting. Uh, I'd never done that before, but as my first test, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible and I hadn't learned Mesh Mixer yet at all. So I was just looking for something that I could scan quickly and easily and kind of just do the minimal amount of work to print a clone of that object and then check dimensional accuracy. So I started with this wireless computer mouse. I did use it on my turntable right here. And when I completed that scan, I saw within the software that it looked pretty good actually. Uh, it had some erroneous faces and surfaces that kind of had to be cleaned up. Uh, that can be done within the Creality software. It has some very basic mesh editing features. I did learn how to do it in Mesh Mixer with a couple quick tutorials. Um, I was able to clean it up pretty well uh, and then I just printed a copy of it. And I have to say, it's a pretty good match. The question is, is it dimensionally accurate? The answer is, Actually, yes, and quite a bit better than I expected. Uh, I measured the width right here on the, on the tail of the mouse. I measured the width and uh, the scroll wheel, which is probably the hardest feature, had the most error and it was 0.3 millimeters, I think. Uh, it was impressively low. Maybe I just don't have experience with 3D scanners, but I wasn't expecting that. In my last video, I did a time lapse of me building a CNC machine called the MPCNC, and it involved cutting steel tubes, like steel conduit. And for that, I used an abrasive wheel on an angle grinder that I've got. I needed a way to mount it and like a jig for it to use it as a cutoff wheel. So I found something online that I was very impressed with, but the model I found was for a different angle grinder. So the clamp did not fit my, my angle grinder. It was close enough, I could kind of jerry-rig it in there, but the end result was not square. So I thought it would be fun to scan my angle grinder and see if I could extract the part of the model where the clamp would go around it to grip it and then print a perfectly fitting clamp around it. First, I tried to scan this on the table right here. Uh, I kind of scanned like the front of it on one side and then tried to flip it over and do it again and flip it over. So I was kind of scanning a third at a time. The scanner had some serious problems with that, uh, trying, to, trying to restart tracking uh, between the flips. And, and I also had like only two hands to do this. It was a little too big and unwieldy, especially with the cord to do it on this turntable and decided to try hanging this thing from the cord, which I know is probably not very good, but I hung it from the cord kind of overhead and was able to use the scanner and kind of like walk around it. This is where the first, and honestly, I think the biggest major problem with the scanner comes in. Uh, I was able to succeed, but the way these scanners work is they tend to take lots of frames every second and use information about the geometry or the, the pictures it's, it's generating to register frames. So it can kind of understand how the object is moving through time, either because the scanner is moving or the object is moving. If you have a, a very regular object, uh, say a flat surface or a, a fairly regular cylinder, it may not be able to know which side of that cylinder or which part of that surface you're looking at. And the angle grinder definitely had that problem. My first two scans, it would lose tracking and think that it was looking at the other side. Uh, and then it would create a new surface for the abrasive wheel on the grinder. The third time's a charm. And I was extremely careful to hold the camera, even though it told me to hold a little closer, I held it a little bit further away to make sure that it, it always had kind of an irregular reference that it could use to know where it was. And that generally worked. I got through 95% of the scan with no issue whatsoever. It was only the last moment that it lost tracking and then flipped on me and created a false surface. But I was pretty much done. The whole model was pretty much green by that point. So I stopped it and I just dealt with the false surface in the software. 
So by this point, I had done a bunch of mesh mixer tutorials with this specific task in mind. So I rolled up my sleeves and got into it. So the first thing I did was the easiest, removing that false surface that it generated at the end of the scan and also just kind of a few other parts of the model that I didn't need. Next, I found all the disconnected bodies and removed those. That's basically just noise in the scanner. And then I wanted to align the model based on the disc surface. So first I removed that center clamp in the model, erase and fill operation where it removes all those faces and then just uses the remaining surface to try to fill in that hole. And the remaining surface was flat. So it did fill in a very nice flat section. So then I was able to do a remesh and reduce and that's when I was able to drop a pivot on it to align that pivot with the XZ plane. So that means the entire model should be rotated so that the disc is perfectly on the XZ plane. And then I was able to do the last bit of rotation to get the body of the angle grinder uh, horizontal. It was not exact, but it was good enough. After that, I was able to export it as an STL or OBJ file, I forget which, uh, that was easy to import into Fusion as a mesh. From there, I tried a bunch of standard operations that I would normally do on a body that I had designed in Fusion. It mostly went well, but because I guess this is a different kind of body, it's not parametric, it's just a mesh, or maybe I had made it a solid body by that point, but it wasn't really a normal kind of object I, I would normally operate on in Fusion. Trying to do extrusions or various mappings of points on it just really didn't work. It was very frustrating. It kept giving me compute failed. Usually I was able to do things in a different way, and usually at least one of those ways worked. And then the last thing I did was I designed and added this little material holder uh, that allows you to clamp a part to it and hold it completely square with the rest of the frame. So I printed this all out and assembled it and the fit was friggin' solid. Like I could not believe how good the fit was and the fact that visually the squareness looked perfect. I did take a one, two, three block to it, but because of the size, I couldn't get a great assessment of its squareness, but at least to the extent that I tried, it looked pretty darn square. So I tried a steel tube, which was the original motivation for all this, and it actually did a pretty darn good job. It's not perfectly square, but this is actually a usable jig I will actually use this. So I'm calling that a big success for this device. Next I did what I think everyone with a 3D scanner wants to do, which is try to scan my head and print a copy of it. So I tried to scan my head and then my son's head and then my daughter's head and the face, it got awesomely. And especially when you have the color from the scanner, you get a pretty good looking 3D model within the software. But as you can see, it struggles immensely with hair. In fact, I tried this so many times, I thought I would spend more time on the hair, uh, just very slowly going around it. It could not get anyone's hair. Um, so while I was able to get a great face scan, I could not get the rest of the head. But I still wanted to do something with my face. So the first thing I did was I tried to turn it sideways and make a profile view of it. Then I sent it to Fusion, which I then cut out on my CNC machine as if I was making like a, a wooden sculpture. Technically, I guess it worked, uh, but I found out later that this isn't the way you're actually supposed to make these. It, you should actually use something called a low relief or a bass relief, which is what they use like on coins. This was technically successful, but not all that useful. So my next idea was, what can I do with just my face? the parts of the scan that were good. <laughs> At first I thought, hey, maybe I can attach like someone else's hair or a model of something. And the first thing that came to mind was this really cute hedgehog that I printed uh, for my family that they thought was adorable. Maybe I can use its little spikes around its body to, to replace my hair. That would be fun, right? Instead, since I have no artistic skill and no sculpting experience, I accidentally made this abomination. Hope you enjoy your creepy hedgehog nightmares. Despite how creepy this thing is, it does look like me. I'm actually impressed with that. You know what my family isn't impressed with? This. <laughs> don't, don't do this. I think I'm gonna have to throw this in a drawer and one day when my grandchildren are dealing with my estate, they'll find this and wonder what the fuck was wrong with grandpa. And there was actually a second problem when I scanned the face. It wasn't just the hair that was a problem, but actually the eyes. Basically detected the eyelids and the, the eyelids were closed. So this, the 3D model that I got after scanning my face, I had to learn some mesh mixer sculpting tools and sculpt the eyelids to make them look more normal. And then I had to add spheres behind them to represent those eyes because they weren't detected. This is a case where the color they put on the final model that it produces uh, is masking a problem. It, put the color of my eyes on my eyelids, but when I remove the color and just look at the model, I end up with closed eyes. So that required some sculpting to actually get that to look good. Next, I wanna talk about where things went downhill. So while waiting for the scanner, I designed this two axis turntable that I mentioned earlier. I thought it was gonna be killer. It was gonna solve all the problems that people typically have with these scanners. But honestly, most things I put into this turntable failed. Like even in turntable mode, it frequently picked up the table itself as part of the scan. Uh, the docs say that there's an option for remove solid uh, flat base but that option wasn't in the software, but it did have a turntable mode, which I would expect would do that for you. It didn't. And 
because the table was, was spinning, it would cause these catastrophic tracking failures where it would just start spiraling out of control. It was kind of fun to watch in the software as it was happening, but it was maddening because I couldn't get anything scanned. And like I alluded to with the angle grinder, a lot of the things I tried scanning were just too regular for it. That, for instance, this peanut butter jar, I assumed would not be too difficult because it has a lot of distinct visual features on it and it failed miserably. Even when the peanut butter jar was sitting totally still, the, the, the scanner thought that it was spinning. Again, I think this goes back to the fact that it's it seems to be registering frame to frame how the model is moving based solely on geometry. So if you have a, a geometry that's like a perfect cylinder, like a peanut butter jar, uh, it can't tell whether it's turning. One of the mitigations for this is to use markers. So the device actually came with these little white stickers that it uses as markers. You can put them on an object that you expect to have trouble scanning. And this time the peanut butter jar was spinning, but the model that it was detecting was not. So it still failed in a way that I couldn't use the model. I did see a couple flashes where those dots had turned to green, uh, but for most of the time it was red. My guess is that something was wrong with the software or my setup. It was acknowledging that the markers were there, but something wasn't right, so it wasn't actually using them. I don't know if this is a bug in the beta software. If I missed something, I probably didn't enable a setting somewhere. And this is really the Achilles heel of this device. Any surface that has symmetry or flat surfaces or repeating patterns, it, it just constantly loses tracking. Like when I tried to scan this one, two, three block, every time it would misregister the whole pattern, lose tracking, because when it was viewing one side, it wouldn't know whether it was on the front side or the back side, and then it would just spontaneously shift to that side. I scanned a lot more things than I showed here, but I generally ran into the same pattern. It just could not figure out these regular objects. Uh, and my hypothesis was this shell would be perfect. I put this thing on the turntable and the thing scanned like a dream. Just kind of plop it on there and let it spin on the turntable and let the camera move kind of up and down to get kind of an overhead and, and side view of the thing. And did spectacularly. I was wildly impressed with this. I couldn't really confirm whether it handled reflective surfaces, but I can say by how easily it picked up that black turntable and how much trouble that was, I can say it does pick up black objects. My one, two, three block really did not work, but I believe that that was not a feature of the reflective surface uh, because of the things I mentioned before. It does have markers for a reason. This is not a new problem in the world of 3D scanning. It is possible that the beta software did not handle that the way it should. That is actually a software problem that potentially could just be fixed in a future update to the software. So you wouldn't need a new device, you just need a newer version of the software to make that work. Another software fix they could make would be to somehow tie in the visual information that the scanner gets, not just the geometry, into the frame registration. Because what, like for instance, when I was scanning that peanut butter jar, uh, it could have very easily used the writing or the shape of the label to know how the object was changing relative to the scanner, but it didn't. Take your time. Uh, each scan takes about three to eight minutes. I mean, it depends what you're doing, but you know, you gotta move pretty slowly and you gotta watch the interface and wait for it to update the model with green dots. It's high confidence that it has that part of the model solved, so to say, and focus on parts of the model that are showing red, meaning that it needs more information to make sure it gets that. This is an absurdly inexpensive 3D scanner. Because of that price, I had really low expectations, but it definitely beat those expectations, but it did fail at a lot of things. Uh, this isn't for everyone or for every application. Something else to know that's not really specific to the scanner, but uh, in general, if you're dealing with scanning is that, uh, like for instance, I use Fusion 360, it really does not handle the meshes that come out of these devices. The meshes are just such high polygon counts. Fusion isn't really designed for that. Uh, that's why I learned Mesh Mixer. Mesh Mixer also has a variety of like sculpting tools. You're going to have to watch some YouTube videos or do some tutorials or something. It's a powerful piece of software if you learn to use it, uh, and I found it immensely helpful in trying to clean up the models that, that I scanned with this. So the $400 question is, knowing what I know now, if I didn't have the scanner, would I buy it? The answer is yes. Uh, given its embarrassingly low price point, I'm actually wildly impressed with it. It certainly had its shortcomings. By the time that you're watching this video, it's possible that these aren't even issues anymore. And for the things that it works for now, and things that I'm pretty sure I could get to work just through more experience, uh, fantastic. The color scanning was awesome. The dimensional accuracy was awesome. The software, it was a little weird, but it got the job done and it wasn't actually that bad once you had some experience with it. So I am actually very impressed with this scanner and I'm looking forward to using it in some more projects going forward. I hope that was helpful. Be sure to check the description down there for links and information about this device. If you like this content, you think I've earned it, give me a like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.